Hi, good evening. Here we are for a little bit more of The Phantom Tollbooth, written by Norton Jester. Before I start, I just need to let you know this is now the fifth time I have sat here and pressed record. I think my brain is a bit tired from all the wrestlemania and I've been doing. Staying up that light is not good for the old brain, apparently. I'm just hibbity 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 up talking a load of nonsense. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is read the chapter, be done with it. It's only a very, very short chapter tonight as well. Um, it's chapter six, Faintly Macabre Story. So I'm just going to hit it, be done with it, see you tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Um, now it is Faintly Macabre Story. If you remember, she was that witch, not W-I-T-C-H, witch, W-H-I-C-H, witch. And she was in that dungeon. She had quite quite a high-pitched voice, I remember. So, um, yeah, I'll do it in that voice. The whole chapter is her talking, I believe. So um, we'll see how it goes. I've got my window open to stop any yawning. <laughs> so if you hear anything, it's just traffic noise. I live on a main road. Here we go. Once upon a time, this land was a barren and frightening wilderness whose high rocky mountains sheltered the evil winds and whose barren valleys offered hospitality to no man. Few things grew and those that did were bent and twisted and their fruit was as bitter as wormwood. What wasn't waste was desert and what wasn't desert was rock and the demons of darkness made their home in the hills. Evil creatures roamed at will through the countryside and down to the sea. It was known as the Land of Null. Then, one day, a small ship appeared on the Sea of Knowledge. It carried a young prince seeking the future. In the name of goodness and truth, he laid claim to all the country and set out to explore his new domain. The demons, monsters and giants were furious at his presumption and banded together to drive him out. The earth shook with their battle and when they'd finished all that remained to the prince was a small piece of land at the edge of the sea. I'll build my city here, he declared, and that is what he did. Before long more ships came bearing settlers for the new land and the city grew and pushed its boundaries further and further out. Each day it was attacked anew but nothing could destroy the prince's new city. It was a kingdom and it was called the Kingdom of Wisdom. But outside the walls all was not safe and the new king vowed to conquer the land that was rightfully his. So each spring he set forth with his army and each autumn he returned and year by year the kingdom grew larger and more prosperous. He took to himself a wife and before long had two fine young sons to whom he taught everything he knew so that one day they might rule wisely. When the boys grew to young manhood the king called them to him and said I am becoming an old man and can no longer go forth to battle. You two must take my place and find, find, find oh, <laughs> you must take my place and found new cities in the wilderness for the kingdom of wisdom must grow. And so they did. One went to south of the foothills of confusion and he built Dictionopolis, the city of words. One went north to the mountains of ignorance and built Digitopolis the city of numbers. Both cities flourished mightily and the demons were driven back further still. Soon other cities and towns were founded in the new lands and at last only the farthest reaches of the wilderness remained to these terrible creatures. And there they waited, ready to strike down all who ventured near or relax their guard. The two brothers were glad, however, to go their separate ways, for they were by nature very suspicious and jealous. Each one tried to outdo the other, and so they worked so hard and diligently at it that their, before long their cities rivalled even wisdom in size and grandeur. Words are more important than wisdom, said one privately. Numbers are more important than wisdom, thought the other to himself and they grew to dislike each other more and more. The old king, however, knew nothing of his son's animosity and was very happy in the twilight of his reign and spent his days quietly walking and contemplating in the royal gardens. 
His only regret was that he'd never had a daughter, for he loved little girls as much as he loved little boys. One day, as he was strolling peacefully about the grounds, he discovered two tiny babies that had been abandoned in a basket under the grape arbour. They were beautiful, golden-haired girls. The king was overjoyed. They must have been sent to crown my old age, he cried, and called the queen, his ministers, the palace staff, and indeed the entire population to see them. We'll call this one Rhyme and this one Reason, he said. And so they became the Princess of Sweet Rhyme and the Princess of Pure Reason, and they were brought up in the palace. When the old king finally died, the kingdom was divided between his two sons with the provision that they would be equally responsible for the welfare of the young princesses. One son went south and became Azaz, the unabridged king of Dictionopolis and the other went north and became the mathematician, ruler of Digitopolis, and, true to their words, they provided well for the little girls who continued to live in wisdom. Everyone loved the princesses because of their great beauty, their gentle ways, and their ability to settle all controversies fairly and reasonably. People with problems or grievances or arguments came from all over the land to seek advice, and even the two brothers who by this time were fighting continuously, often called upon them to help decide matters of state. It was said by everyone that rhyme and reason answer all problems. As the years passed, the two brothers grew further and further apart, and their separate kingdoms became richer and grander. Their disputes, however, became more and more difficult to reconcile. But always, with patience and love, the princesses set things right. There they are. Then one day they had the most terrible quarrel of all. King Azaz insisted that words were far more significant than numbers, and hence his kingdom was truly the greater, and the magician claimed that numbers were much more important than words, and hence his kingdom was supreme. They discussed and debated and raved and ranted until they were on the verge of blows when it was decided to submit the question to arbitration by the princesses. After days of careful consideration in which all the evidence was weighed and all the witnesses heard, the princesses made their decision. Words and numbers are of equal value for, in the cloak of knowledge, one is warp and the other weft. It is no more important to count the sands than it is to name the stars. Therefore, let both kingdoms live in peace. Everybody was pleased with the verdict. Everyone, that is, except the brothers, who were beside themselves with anger. What good are these girls if they cannot settle an argument in someone's favour? They growled, since both were more interested in their own advantage than in the truth. We shall banish them from the kingdom forever. And so, they were taken from the palace and sent far away to the castle in the air, and they have not been seen since. That is why today in all this land there is neither rhyme nor reason. And what happened to the other two rulers? asked Moiley. Banishing the two princesses was the last thing they ever agreed upon, and soon they fell to warring with each other. Despite this, their own kingdoms have continued to prosper. (laughs) But the old lady of wisdom has fallen into great disrepair, and there is no one. The old city of wisdom has fallen into great disrepair, and there is no one to set things right. So, you see, until a princess's return, I have to stay here. (sighs) Maybe we can rescue him, said Milo, as he saw how sad the witch looked. Ah, that would be difficult, she replied. The castle in the air is far from here. And the one stairway which leads to it is guarded by fierce and black-hearted demons. Tok growled ominously, for he hated even the thought of demons. I'm afraid there's not much a little boy and a dog can do, she said. But never you mind, it's not so bad. I've grown quite used to it down here. But you must be going or else you'll waste the whole day. Ah, don't worry, we're in here for six million years, sighed Milo. I don't see any way to escape. Nonsense, scolded the witch. You mustn't take Officer Shrift so seriously. He loves to put people in prison, but he don't care about keeping them there. Now, just press that button in the wall and be on your way. 
Milo pressed the button and a door swung open, letting in a shaft of brilliant sunshine. Bye, come again, shouted the witch as they stepped outside and the door slammed shut. Milo and Tox stood blinking in the bright light and, as their eyes became accustomed to it, the first things they saw were the king's advisers again rushing towards them. Ah, there you are. Where have you been? We've been looking all over for you. The royal banquet's about to begin. Come with us. They seemed very agitated and out of breath as Milo walked along with them. But what about my car? he asked. You don't need it. No use for it. Superfluous, advised the Count. Unnecessary, stated the L. Uncalled for, cried the Undersecretary. We'll take our vehicle. Conveyance. Rig. Sharabank. Chariot. Buggy. Coach. Brougham. Chandrilan. Chandridan, he repeated quickly in order and pointed to a small wooden wagon. Ah, oh dear, it's all those words again, thought Milo as he climbed into the wagon with Toc and the cabinet members. How are you going to make it move? It don't have a... Be very quiet, advised the Duke, for it goes without saying. And sure enough, as soon as they were all quiet, quite still, it began to move quickly through the streets and in a very short time, they arrived at the Royal Palace. Chapter 7 is called the Royal Banquet. <gasps> So, what are you thinking about the witch, the witch, W-H-I-C-H, witch's story? Is she telling him the truth? Or is she actually a baddie and setting him up for something? Obviously, I don't know. I'm just trying to work out where little, little threads are inside the story here. Worth a think, isn't it? All right. Okay. I promise I'm going to have an early night tonight. And, um... Pfft. I can't have another, I'll probably have an early morning. I just wake up at the crack of dawn. As soon as I hear a bird sing out there, <gasps> I'm awake. That's it. The sky is awake, so I'm awake. That's from Frozen. I don't know why I know that, but that's me. All right, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. All right.